In the heart of the Swiss Alps, on the high frontier between earth and sky, stands one of the great mountains of the world. To men generally, it is known as the Citadel, but the people of the village of Kurtal, in the valley below, seldom call it by that name. They call it the Rudisberg, Rudy's Mountain. And that is because in the long gone year of 1865, there lived in that valley a boy called Rudy Matt. Rudy was 16. While other boys of the village were out learning to be mountain guides, Rudy worked as a dishwasher in the Bowsight Hotel. On a certain summer morning... Slow down, boy. That's the second broken cup this morning. Teo, can I finish later? It's such a beautiful morning. You are your father's son, all right. It's mountains that are in your blood, not dishwater. My father? What would the great guy Joseph Matt say if he could see me now, working in the kitchen like a girl or an old man? Oh, Teo, I I'm sorry. Never mind. I haven't always been a crippled hotel chef. Remember, I was with your father 15 years ago when he attempted to climb the Citadel. He and I and Sir Edward Stevenson, his employer. I know, Teo. That's why I... Your mother is afraid you will die, as your father did. She has such plans for your future. A trade, a profession. Soon you will go to a big hotel in Zurich for training. So that I can become a clerk or a proprietor? But that isn't what I want. Please, Teo, can I leave? I promise to finish the dishes later. After you have made your usual climb, eh? To get a good look at the approaches to the citadel. Ah, you have the same dream as your father, to climb the citadel. How did you know? I know, I know. Well, what are you waiting for? Oh, Teo, thank you. Rudy Matt climbed upward along a familiar path. As always, he stopped at his father's small shrine at the forest's edge. Rudy had never known his father. It had been 15 years since he had died. But every time the boy came to this place, he stopped and prayed. A few steps further on, he reached for a stout stick hidden in the branches of a large blue spruce. This was his alpenstock, the climber's staff he had made for himself as a substitute for an ice axe. He kept it hidden here because he was afraid that if he took it home, his mother or uncle might find it. Rudy climbed on, and as his eyes moved upward across the wide circle of mountain ranges, there it was, the citadel. The other mountains were as nothing beside it. It rose in cliff upon cliff until the sharp curving wedge of its summit seemed to pierce the very heart of the sky. Suddenly, a cold finger of fear touched the boy. It cannot be climbed. It cannot be climbed. There are demons on the mountain. Demons that destroy. But as Rudy looked up and saw the sun bright and golden overhead, his momentary fear left him. He was almost to the top of the Blue Glacier, where he would have a good view of the southeast face of the citadel, when suddenly he stopped, ears straining. Hello! Hello! This was a human voice, Rudy knew, not that of a demon. He went from one crevasse to another, peering over the edges. Hello! 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 How far down are you? I'm not sure. About 20 feet, I guess. On the bottom? No, I can't even see the bottom. I was lucky and hit a ledge. Swiftly, Rudy removed his jacket and tied it by one sleeve to the curved end of his staff. Then his shirt, his trousers. The improvised rope continued until the boy was naked except for shoes, stockings, and underpants. With feet and hands, he kicked and scraped the ice until he had made two holes. He lay down, digging his toes deep into the holes, lowering the staff like a sort of crazy fishing line. Can you reach it? Yes, but I'll pull you in. No, you won't. How long it went on, Rudy could never say. 
cold rose from the ice into his blood and bones. His hands burned and ached from holding on. Finally, there was a scraping sound close beneath him, a hand on the rim of ice, a figure pulling itself up onto the lip of the crevasse. Then it was over. The man was safe. Why, you're just a boy. And you saved my life. It was nothing. Nothing? It's a miracle how you did it. A boy of your size, all alone. The man unknotted Rudy's clothes and helped him to dress, pummeling the boy into the warmth of returning circulation. He was a tall, thin man of about 30, with a hawk-like nose and a strong, jutting chin. Not French, or German, or Swiss, or one of the tourists who flooded the mountainsides in summer. English, perhaps? Suddenly, with deep excitement, Rudy knew who the man was, the most famous mountain climber of the day. You are Captain John Winter? Well, that's right. What's your name, son? Rudy. Rudy Mott. Not of the family of the great Joseph Mott. He was my father. Did you know him? Oh, no, no. He was before my day, but ever since I was a boy, I've heard of the great guy Joseph Mott. But he was the only guy who thought the Citadel could be climbed. Is that why you have come here? To climb the Citadel? Well, I can't climb it alone. All the guides of Kutal have turned me down. Even your Uncle Franz. So I, uh, I may go over to the next valley, to Brawley. I'm told there's a guide there who's not afraid. Emil Saxo. Do you know him? Yes, Rudy had heard of the guide Saxo. But he did not want to think now of the anger and rivalry that raged between the villages of Kurtal and Broly. This moment was too perfect to spoil by lingering on old prejudices. The southeast ridge is the best way, isn't it, Rudy? It was the way your father tried. This Captain John Winter shared Rudy's dream, one of the great climbers of the world, and he was actually asking Rudy's opinion on possible approaches to the Citadel. Later, as Rudy and Captain Winter threaded their way down the Blue Glacier, the late afternoon stillness was broken by a great roaring as sun-loosened rock and ice broke off from the heights of the Citadel. Uh, what do you do, Rudy? I'm a, a dishwasher at the Bowside Hotel, sir. My mother, since my father died, she... Well, I'm to go into the hotel business. Will you do me a favor, sir? Well, of course. Before we come to the town, we'll separate. And please don't tell anyone that I have been up here. You saved my life, and you want to keep it a secret? Please, sir. If my mother and uncle here... Don't worry. I won't tell. Despite old Teo's attempts to cover for him, Rudy's absence from the hotel was known to his uncle. Franz Lerner and Frau Matt waited. Well, what do you have to say for yourself? I'm sorry, Uncle. You promised me not to climb, Rudy. Why didn't you keep your promise? I don't know. You don't know? Well, how can I explain? I didn't mean to go. I never really think of going. But when I stand there at the kitchen windows and see the sun and the mountains... Oh, Rudy. You are a good boy in all things but this. You have such a fine future in the hotel. I'll go to the hotel now and finish the dishes. But before Rudy could leave, Captain John Winter himself appeared at the cottage of Frau Matt. He engaged the services of Franz Lerner for a climb to the Wunderhorn, a mountain affording a clear view of the citadel. Winter pretended not to know Rudy, but when he realized the secret was already out, he asked if the boy could go on the climb as a helper. Franz and Frau Matt were dumbstruck as Captain Winter described how Rudy had saved his life. No detail of Rudy's skill and bravery was left out. Oh, please! Just this once, let me come. Captain Winter knows I can do it. Up on the glacier today, he saw what I can do. He deserves a reward. Let him come, please. All right, Rudy. But just this once. Do you understand? Joyfully, Rudy rushed off to the hotel, where 200 dirty dishes awaited him. <laughs> and during the whole evening, he broke only three. That night, Rudy once again dreamed the old dream. He stood on the very crest of a mountain, not the Wunderhorn, but the mountain. He unstrapped his pole, took a red flannel shirt from his knapsack, 
and tied the shirt to the pole by its sleeves. He set the pole in the snow, the magical shining snow upon which no man had ever stood before. And the shirt flapped like a flame on the white summit of the citadel, a banner in the sky. dream was still with him. He took a carefully folded red shirt from the bottom of his chest. Inside the neck were sewn letters that spelled Joseph Matt. The letters were faded. There were moth holes in the shirt. Tenderly, Rudy refolded the shirt and placed it in the chest. Soon after, to his stunned amazement, a messenger arrived with a note. If you will go to Alex Bergner's shop, you will find ordered for you some things that may be useful. They are only a small token of the admiration and gratitude of your friend and fellow climber, John Winter. It was not to be believed. In the shop of Alex Bergner were a gleaming new ice axe and knapsack, and Herr Bergner brought him a pair of boots to try on for size. Rudy tramped the streets for an hour, breaking in the new boots, but he was careful to remove them before walking on his mother's polished floor. Such fine gifts, Rudy, but what a waste since you will be using them only once. After today, these gifts will go to the house of your uncle. He can use a new axe, and the boots can perhaps be sold to a guide with small feet. When Franz Lerner arrived, he eyed the new equipment with grudging admiration. Oh, why is it that for 20 years I've been climbing on glaciers, and for me there has never been a rich Englishman waiting in a crevasse? Please, watch out for him, Franz. Don't worry, Ilse. The Wonderhorn, it is nothing. Rudy was happy to be where he belonged, a man among men. But as the sun grew hotter, his pack grew heavier, and often he stumbled. With every step, he was learning that it was one thing to roam the mountains free and unencumbered, and quite another to be a porter carrying a 30-pound load. But Rudy would have bitten his tongue off before he complained. At last, they came to the overnight hut near the base of the Wonderhorn. In that year of 1865, the hut was nothing like the small alpine hotels that would one day punctuate the mountains. But it was snug and comfortable, with room for as many as 30 people. Early the next morning, Captain Winter, Franz, and Rudy started off again. It was noon when they reached the shoulder of the Winterhorn from where they could get a good look at the citadel. High though they were, perhaps 11,000 feet, the citadel soared above them, its southeast face clear in the sunlight. Rudy's eyes fixed upon the dark outthrust of rock known as the fortress, the highest point reached by his father and Sir Edward Stevenson. Franz, on your brother-in-law's attempt, did he get to the top of the fortress? No, my captain, only to the base. Yes, but he believed there was a way over it. Well, over or around it, yes. What do you believe? I have no belief. I know nothing of the Citadel. Wouldn't you like to know? It is evil. A killer mountain. It has been left alone now for 15 years. And it is best that it be left alone forever. While his uncle and Captain Winter talked, Rudy had an idea. He would look for a more direct way down the Wunderhorn than the way they had come. That would be his contribution to the day's climbing. After one possible starting off place led nowhere, he discovered a second break in the rim that promised a route. It began with a deep cleft or chimney, and down this Rudy lowered himself with ease. At the bottom was a broad ledge leading to a jutting platform. Feeling bold and unafraid, Rudy took a careful step. And then a second step, a third. One more would bring him to the jutting platform. Then there was a soft tremor beneath his feet. A violent leap thrust him clear of the crumbling foothold and he landed on the platform. Behind him, the whole ledge on which he had been standing disintegrated and plunged in spinning fragments into space below. Rudy was trapped. Inching to the edge of the platform, he tried over and over to secure a foothold on the crumbled rock where the ledge had been. 
For the first time in his life, he was dizzy. The glacier far below him began to spin like a great white wheel. But before he could call for help... Stay where you are! Don't move! I'm coming for you! No! No, he is my nephew, my responsibility! Wait, Uncle. I will try again. I'm lighter than either of you. But Franz had already laid down his ice axe and unslung his pack. He tied one end of the rope around his waist and handed the other to Winter. As Franz made off to the side, it seemed at times that he would almost surely pull Winter off the ledge. Franz put a foot on the crumpled rock, tested, put his weight on it. An eternity passed as he groped for holes in the smooth wall above him. There was an instant when he teetered above empty space, supported by a half inch of toe on the crumbling mountainside. A lunge, and he was beside Rudy on the solid platform. What a beautiful feat of climbing. But Franz Lerner was in no mood for compliments. Pulling in the rope that trailed behind him, he made a loop near its middle and tied Rudy into it. At last, Rudy was beside Winter on the broad ledge, with Franz following. Don't worry about it, son. All of us make mistakes. Look at me, walking straight into a crevasse. But Rudy felt a searing shame. Yes, anyone could make a mistake, but his had been the worst of all sins that a mountaineer can commit. He had made others risk their lives to save his. In the hotel kitchen, old Teo watched Rudy and said nothing. But he knew that something had gone wrong. Finally, Rudy could keep his misery to himself no longer. He told Teo the whole story. Yes, that was bad. Bad. A guide must think of his employer before everything else and stay by his side at all times. And then the old man talked of Joseph Mott. It was not the citadel that killed your father. When Joseph and I and his employer, Sir Edward Stevenson, made it to the fortress, we had gone farther than any man before us. Then there was a rock slide. Sir Edward's leg was broken, and it was not possible for just the two of us to get him down. Your father decided I would go down for help, slings a stretcher. And you, I asked? I will stay here, he said. It would be noon of the next day before help could arrive, but one of us had to stay. And Joseph Matt, the chief guide, insisted that it be he. I, I was crippled in an accident on the way down. There was a storm. It was three days before the rescue party arrived. They found my father and Sir Edward in a little cave beneath the fortress. They were dead, frozen. Ah, so you know too that your father did not die because a mountain was too steep. Waiting there on that ridge, he himself was strong enough to go on up or to go down. But he would not go because he would not leave his client. He was thinking not of himself, but of another. And his red shirt, the flag that was to fly from the top of the citadel. Do you know where they found it? On Sir Edward Stevenson. Your father had taken it from his own back to try to keep another man warm. Captain Winter had left Kurtal and no one knew where he had gone. Slowly, the days passed. Franz Lerner and Frau Mott made conversation about the weather, the tourists, both assuming the boy had come to his senses. But one day, Rudy overheard words that sent his heart soaring. So many climbers this summer. The huts must be full. Yes, even the old hut. You know, the one beneath the southeast ridge of the citadel that has not been used for years? Even that has someone in it. Today, at the foot of the Blue Glacier, I, uh, I looked up and I saw smoke pluming from its chimney. Rudy was convinced it was John Winter, alone, or he had found a guide. Yes, the captain was there because he had to be, because he could not leave the citadel. It was his mountain, as it was Rudy's mountain. That night, when he was sure his mother was asleep, Rudy crept silently out of bed. He left his mother a note. Mother, do not worry. I will be all right. Love, Rudy.
In the hut below the southeast ridge of the citadel, a giant of a man stared ferociously at Rudy. He was red-faced, with small, piercing eyes as blue and cold as glacier ice. He was Emil Saxo, the guide of Broly. So you are from Kurtal, eh? I thought all Kurtalas were too afraid of their skins to come so close to the citadel. Is... is not Captain John Winter here? As Rudy spoke, Captain Winter entered the hut. Rudy, how did you know I was here? Uh, does your uncle know you've come? But Emil Saxo spared Rudy the necessity of answering the question. Perhaps it is good to have the boy here. He can keep the hut cleaned and have uh, food ready for our return. But sir, that's not why... I mean... I know why you've come, son. It's time we got going. You were starting today, sir? For the actual climb, no. Today we're just going to reconnoiter. But before we make our real try in a couple of days, we'll have to go down for more food and equipment. Rudy... You can come along as an apprentice porter, but uh, only for today, as we reconnoiter. And you must promise no individual climbing or route finding on your own. We'll do exactly as Emil and I tell you to do. The three climbers were on their way. Following the route Winter had chosen, they came out on the smaller tributary glacier that descended from the east face of the citadel. Here the gradient steepened sharply, and they roped up. The next two hours they zigzagged slowly up the long incline of ice. Positioned in the middle of the rope, Rudy burned to take the lead. But he remembered what the captain had said to him. On such a slope, the work of the leader was arduous, for almost every move required the cutting of a step before their feet could gain a hold in the smooth surface the bright prong of the axe rose and fell. Time seemed to have stopped as the three groped their way through a white wilderness of towers, ridges, and deep gullies. They rested, ate snacks of cheese and chocolate, and moved on again. And then suddenly, what rose above them was a wave, a white wave so huge that it seemed the whole mountainside had peeled off and was descending upon their heads. Avalanche! Up on the rocks, quick! 